You know, it seems that there's pretty much a website for any topic that you're interested in today. I came across one that uh, seems somewhat strange. It's, it's about epitaphs. And an epitaph is something that's written about somebody after they pass away. Sometimes it's maybe written in the newspaper. Sometimes it's written on the uh, gravestone. But it says something about that person. And here's some of the interesting ones I came across. In a Georgia cemetery, the epitaph read, I told you I was sick. Another epitaph read, she always said her feet were killing her, but nobody believed her. Another one says, here lies my wife. Here, let her lie. Now she's at rest, and so am I. A little, <laughs> little poetic. And then, and then there was another one. Uh, it says, in memory of Abraham Ballou, accidentally shot 4th of April, 1844, as a mark of affection from his brother. That's what it read, as a mark of affection from his brother. I really like this one. This is one in Maryland Cemetery there. It said, here lies an atheist, all dressed up and no place to go. I would like to modify that with no desirable place to go. If you'll remember a couple of Sundays back, we started a brand new sermon series where I'm uh, taking a passage in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're taking a look at how the Hebrew writer uh, metaphorically says we're all in a race. Our Christian life is one big race. We're down on the track, and there's fans in the stands watching us as we run, and he's pointing to all these people in the bleachers as, uh, as encouragers for us as we run down on the track. You could even say uh, we have home field advantage and we have the fans on our side. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, he lists all these fans that are in the stands cheering for us as we run our Christian race. And last, last Sunday, we, we started off with, with Abel and we took a look at him. Abel shows us uh, how God wants us to live a godly life when we worship him. Uh, our worship pleases God when our, our life really matches our worship through the week. And today we come to another character. His name is Enoch. He's kind of obscure, but nevertheless, he was someone that we need to be aware of because he is one that's mentioned here in the Hall of Faith. He's a man who demonstrated faith. He is one of the people who are metaphorically, at least, in the stands watching us as we run. And his, his story, oh, I can't even say story, just so little that we know of him, is found in Genesis chapter 5. Verses, uh, we're going to look at verses 3 through 24. I want us to do a little exercise, but what we're going to see here in this passage is Enoch's epitaph. Enoch's epitaph. That's pretty much what it's all about. Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 3. This is a genealogical account of the descendants of, of Adam and Eve. And what I want to do is I, I want to read uh, something about each character here, and then I'm, I'm going to pause. If you have an NIV, you'll notice it's broken down into paragraphs, and I'm going to let you read the last part. And your part's going to simply be, then he died. Think y'all can handle that? Then he died. That's what you're going to say. For example, verse 3, when, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Adam lived 930 years and when Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Seth lived 912 years. And when Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. And after he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Enosh lived 905 years. And when Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahaliel. And after he became the father of Mahaliel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Kenan lived 910 years. And when Mahaliel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. And after he became the father of Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Mahaliel lived 895 years. And when Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. 
And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years in. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech, and after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters all together. Methuselah lived 969 years in. Okay, that's enough. I'm getting tired of this. <laughs> what I want you to notice here, out of all these characters mentioned, only one doesn't say, and then he died. And that's Enoch. Verse 24, it just says he walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. So I'm going to say his epitaph is this. He walked with God. Because nothing memorable is mentioned about any of these other characters. All it says, it just talks about they lived and then they died. That's it. Nothing memorable whatsoever is mentioned. But not so with Enoch. There was something very special about him. It says he walked with God. And as a result of walking with God, God took him away. We don't know how he took him away. Probably something similar to Elijah. By the way, there's only two people in the Bible. Just a little bit of trivia you might want to know. Ever playing Bible trivia. There's only two people in the Bible that never died. Enoch is one of them. Elijah's the other. Remember how Elijah left this world? He left in a whirlwind. I guess kind of like a tornado like we had last week. You know, it went up in a whirlwind. And uh, God just took him and they made a search for him. I think it says something like 50 people went out. They were looking for him. They thought, well, maybe, maybe God just picked him up and will set him down on a hillside out here somewhere. Maybe set him down in a valley. So they made a search. Couldn't find him. God had taken him away. We see the same idea here. With Enoch. He, he was just, just taken away. So let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 11. This will be our, our main passage this morning since we're looking at the people in the stands as we run our race. We come to Hebrews 11. Verse 5, it gives us maybe a little more information than we find in the Genesis account. It says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. Well, that that kind of indicates that they had take, made a search for him after he was taken away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So here we're just simply told that, that Enoch pleased God. And I find this interesting that this word pleased God is synonymous with walked with God. In fact, in the Greek Old Testament, uh, that's the way it's translated, walked with God. And then what I read to you here, it says just, pleased God. Same idea. To, to, to walk with God, um, it's, it's a metaphor and it conveys the idea of living in a close, uh, personal relationship with Him. It's just like if you went on a, a peaceful walk with your spouse or, or somebody in your family, somebody you care about, you're, you're walking along with them. Well, if you walk with God, you are going through life uh, in a harmonious relationship with God. Uh, there's, there's, there's communion there. there there's, there's closeness. And, and walk really, it, walk carries the idea too of, of the way you conduct your life. So if you're conducting your life, uh, you're, you're, you're following in God's footsteps, so to speak. If you're conducting yourselves in, yourselves in a godly manner, you're going to be going through life walking with God. And as a result, God will be pleased with you. That's what we see with Enoch. He walked with God, and as a result, God was so pleased with this guy that he just took him on home. Imagine what that was like. Just, just God is so pleased with him that God just says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just take you on up here with me. I, I just want, I want us to be even closer. They were spiritually close on the earth, and God said, I'm just going to bring you on up here. So he, he left this earth. Not sure if it was a dramatic departure like Elijah, as I mentioned earlier, but somehow or another, he was taken, and it seems to indicate again to hear that they, they did make a search for him, and I, I, you know, I can't help but wonder um, who all searched for Enoch. I'd like to believe his family searched for him. What do y'all think? Maybe his mom, his dad, maybe, maybe his, 
his wife, maybe his sons and daughters, maybe grandsons, maybe the whole family. I hope they all search for him. Maybe his church family search for him. He said, well, where are you getting that from? Well, there's a little snippet in Jude 14 that indicates that Enoch was some kind of a preacher because we get a little, a little snippet of one of his prophetic sermons. So I think it's reasonable to conclude that, that he was some type of mouthpiece for God on the earth and when they gathered together for worship, he must have delivered some type of message to the people. Perhaps one day, you know, he didn't show up for the worship service and they waited and waited and waited and then they went and made a search for the preacher. I would like to think you would make a search for me if I didn't show up. You would, wouldn't you? If you, if you came Sunday mornings to where John, I don't know. He, he, he went up in a whirlwind, his wife said. No, no, I don't know. By the way, if, we, if we're alive when the Lord returns, we're going to be taken up, I assume, in a similar way. You realize that? Scripture tells us that when the Lord returns, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are still left alive will go up to meet them in the clouds and be with the Lord forever. Isn't that a wonderful idea? So, so if you're alive when Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to get to experience what Enoch literally experienced, being taken home to be with the Lord without having to die. Okay, let's get back to Enoch here and his life that pleased God because that's, that's what I'm after this morning. I want to know, how do you please God with your life? How do you please God when you walk with Him? And surprisingly, it's not that complex when you, when you look at this text here, it, it tells us what we have to do to live this God-pleasing life. Or it tells us how to have this God-pleasing faith. First of all, we must believe that God exists. You might say, well, why, John? I, and I can't answer that. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've often wondered why God just didn't maybe have His face up in the sky and we can look up and see Him up there. But there's something about believing in Him, even though we can't see Him, that's pleasing to Him. If you want to know why that's the case, you can wait and ask him once you meet him. Other than that, I don't know why, but Scripture teaches us that, that without faith, without believing in him, even though we can't see him, without faith it is impossible to please God. There is something about us believing in him, even though we can't see him, that's pleasing to him. You know, a lot of times people today come up with all kinds of excuses not to believe in God. And I think of the, I think of the agnostic person, you know, they, they try to come off as really intellectual and, you know, well, I'm just not sure. I'll just, I, I don't know, you know. I mean, that sounds real smart, but the agnostic can't please God. They can't live a, a, a life-pleasing faith because they don't really believe in Him. They can't walk with God. They can't please Him because they're not sure. Uh, the atheist the atheist certainly can't please God because an atheist is somebody who just says that they don't believe in God's existence at all. And because of that, you know, they can't live a, a faith that is pleasing to God. This reminds me of the, of the elementary school teacher. She had a, a class full of youngsters and, and uh, she explained to her class that she was an atheist. And she wanted them to know she was an atheist. And then she asked them, she asked the children, too, if they were atheists. And not really wanting to disappoint the teacher, hands went up. They, all these little people started, started raising their hands, except for one little girl. Out of the entire class, a little girl named Lucy. She did not go along with the crowd. And the atheist teacher asked her uh, why she decided to be different. And Lucy replied, because I'm not an atheist. The teacher then asked, well, what are you? She said, I'm a Christian. The teacher got a little perturbed and a little red in the face, and she asked little Lucy, she said, why are you a Christian? And Lucy said, I was brought up a Christian. My dad is a Christian, and my mom is a Christian too. The teacher now was angry. She said, that's no reason. What if your mom was a moron? What would you be then? After a short pause, little Lucy answers, I guess I would be an atheist. <laughs> you know, it really is moronic to be an atheist. You say, well, John, how can you say that? That sounds so anti-intellectual. Really, if, if anybody takes the time to look at the evidence, 
I don't think they will come away an atheist. There is just way too much complexity. Uh, intelligent design is written all over this place. God's fingerprints are everywhere. Um, you can even, I saw a, a video not too long ago about the complexity of a single cell. It, looks, it looked like a, a motor with all these little wheels and everything turning inside it. And it's obvious there was a designer and a creator that all this didn't just come from nothing. And it didn't come from some muck or some kind of soup or something that some people try to say. It's just, there's just way too much complexity for this to have just happened. Here, here, this is a simple illustration to me. Let's say you're walking through the woods. You come up on a campsite. The tent is set up. There's a fire. You know, there's, there's stones all around the fire. It's going. There's a, a chair sitting there, and there's a little table. A cup of coffee on it. It's steaming. And you walk up to all this. But there's nobody there. You can't find anybody. Is it reasonable to conclude that somebody's been there? If somebody set the tent up. Somebody built the fire. Somebody put the stones around it. Somebody made the coffee. How else did the coffee get in the cup? Is coffee steaming? It hadn't been too long ago. You see what I'm saying? There's evidence that someone was there and put all that together. Well, that's, that's much the way... We, we see the universe. There's, there's evidence that someone put all this together. And the Bible itself says, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. People are without excuse if they will just look into it. Next time someone says, oh, I'm an agnostic or I'm, I'm an atheist, says, have you really looked into that? Have you really looked at all sides of this or are you just buying into one side? A lot of times I've found when people say things like, well, I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist, it's really just an excuse. There's a part of their life they don't want to surrender to God and they want to hang on to it. So they cook up this excuse or this smoke screen. I don't know if I believe in God. Well, if they'll look into it, Believe me, they'll look into it with an open mind. They can't help but come away and, and at least believe in intelligent design. But if we're going to walk with God, we have to first believe in His existence. And He's not really asking us to have a blind faith. Again, it's, there's evidence is, is all around us. And keep in mind, this is just the beginning of the walk. Because James tells us that the demons believe and they shudder. So, but the first step... To walking with God, though, is to believe that He exists, and that, that's, that's where you start. And I won't belabor this point much longer, but keep in mind when you hear people talk about evolution, it is the theory of evolution. You realize that, right? It is a theory, and it's a theory that's full of problems. So it's not in concrete. The theory of evolution does not disprove the existence of God. So the first step in pleasing God or having a God-pleasing faith is to believe in His existence. Second, we have to have a faith that believe, a faith that believes in a God who rewards. God wants us to believe that He reward, rewards us. I don't know about you, but I like that idea. We serve a God. Who believes in rewarding his people? Enoch believed in God. He walked with God. He believed in God's existence. And what happened? He was certainly rewarded. He, he, he didn't experience death. And he got to taste the ultimate reward taken literally into heaven. But I guarantee you there was even more rewards than that while he was on the earth. God rewards us on the earth and ultimately in the next life. You know, I, I really can't think of a better reward though than heaven, can you? It doesn't get any better than that. According to the Bible, heaven's going to be a, a wonderful place. Let me give you a brief description. No more death. No more pain. No more crying. No more hunger. Thirst. Darkness. No more heat. You know, heaven is going to be a very happy place where we come to enjoy our master's happiness. It's going to be perfect. Beautiful. Beautiful. Described as the paradise of God. That's the ultimate reward. But again, we also receive rewards on this earth. I don't know if you've ever taken note of this, but in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, you know, Jesus 
gives all this instruction, and, and, and through a lot of that sermon, he follows it up by mentioning that God rewards. For example, in, in Matthew 5, 46, it says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? In other words, we stand to gain a reward if we love those who do not love us. So that person you're having to endure, that person you're having to put up with, God saying, I want you to love them anyway, and I'm going to reward you for it. Chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus warns us to, uh, to be careful not to do our acts of righteousness to be seen by men, or we will have no reward from our Father in heaven. In other words, don't just be good to be seen. You know, don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. God will take care of it. You know, if, we, if we're living just to get a pat on the back from some human, that's the only reward we're going to get. But God says, you do the right thing because I want you to do the right thing. Let that be the motive. You're going to receive a reward. And he goes on to say, you know, the whole talks about even when we fast, we're not to go around and look somber, so draw attention to ourselves. He says, God, God knows that you're doing it. He sees what's done in secret, and he will reward you. But I challenge you to go through there and just, just, just read that, that chapter starting in Matthew chapter 5 and, and notice how God over and over and over again says, I will reward you. I will reward you. I will reward you. We serve a God who wants to reward his people. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 41 and following. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he's a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. You take a little Christian person out to, to lunch or buy them something at Sonic and get them a Happy Meal, you're going to be rewarded even for that. That sounds trivial, but he says even if you give a little Christian a little bit of water, you'll be rewarded. We serve a God who's watching, and we serve a God who wants to reward us. I can't leave off Matthew chapter, Malachi, I should say, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. It's talking about when we give our tithes and offerings to God, he rewards us. God says in Malachi 3.10 that when we give our tithes and offerings, He will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that we will not have room for it. He's talking about material blessings in the context. If you want to see God start moving and working in your life, you give Him 10% of your wealth. And just watch and see what happens. You will see all kinds of things start happening. You will be blessed left and right. Your stuff will last longer. Money will stay in the bank long. I mean, it, just try it. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. God is a God who rewards. He's a God who blesses us. But we have to walk with Him. So the second step in having a God-pleasing faith is believing that He will reward you. Third, we must have a faith that earnestly seeks God. It says that in the Hebrews passage there. He rewards those who, who earnestly seek Him. What does it mean to, to seek God? By the way, that's in the present tense, this idea of, of seeking, which refers to continual action. It refers to somebody wanting to know God more and more. Part of the idea behind this word is to investigate and inquire. You know, if you have a faith that's pleasing God, you're going to have a faith that's interested in God, interested in the things of God. Maybe you've run across somebody and you try to talk to them about God and it's like talking to a blank wall. They're not interested. There's a lot of people you can start trying to talk about God and they'll walk away. They don't care. But the person that's walking with God and the person that wants to please God with their faith, they're going to be interested in God. They're going to want to investigate the things of God. Really, that's the kind of the idea behind this idea of seeking. It's, it's really calling us to be spiritual detectives inquiring about God. There really should be a, a curiosity about you if you belong to Jesus Christ. There should be uh, where you want to investigate and inquire and learn more and more about God. I think of these detective shows on TV. Uh, I'm, I'm not up on the latest ones, but I used to like to watch Law and Order years ago. Um, Cold Case, you know. Even when I was a little kid, I can remember watching Columbo. I don't know if you remember Columbo, but he's, he just looked like a bungling idiot. I mean, he kinda, he, his hair was all messed up. And he, 
he had on like a long dress coat, kind of a khaki color, and it, it, it looked like he'd been wadded up somewhere, and he'd bungle along and stumble along, and you'd think he was the dumbest thing in the world. But in the end, he would always solve the case. And I, and I think God's looking for some spiritual uh, Columbos, if you will. People who will investigate. Persistent investigation. We don't have to look good. We don't have to come off as the brightest people in the world. Uh, but we do need to be good investigators when it comes to learning about God. People who are persistent about it. And I can't think of a better way to investigate God than by getting in God's Word. God has revealed Himself to us through His Word. And He desires that we investigate who He is by getting in His Word. That's one of the reasons we gather here this morning is to investigate God's Word. Learn more about it. That's one of the reasons we come together on, on Wednesday night, to investigate the Word of God. By the way, if you hadn't been coming, it's a good time to start. We just started a study on the book of Acts, and we're studying the early church. And see how God dealt with the early church and how the early church functioned, and we're trying to kind of pattern ourselves after the early church. The new women's Bible study just started up. But, but, but don't, don't just look at those things as optional and something you don't really need. You need it. Everybody needs to investigate and learn more and more about God. Where much is given, much is expected. Think of what all God's given us. The opportunities He's given us, the Word He's given us, uh, the computer programs He's given us, the books, the commentaries, the websites, all these things God has put before us. And I, I really believe He expects us to investigate, and He's holding us today to a higher level of accountability than people in the past who were ignorant, couldn't read, didn't have a copy of the Bible, and didn't even know what a computer was, couldn't even fathom such a thing. But we, we, we really should be a little more knowledgeable than people in the past because we have all these tools available to us to investigate. Uh, we seek God in our worship. You know, we come together to, to worship Him, to draw closer to Him. But keep in mind, uh, our, everything we do, even in worship, must be measured against Scripture to make sure uh, it's of God and godly. Isaiah 55 verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Psalm 14 2 states, The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Deuteronomy 4 29, But if from there, the promised land, you seek the Lord your God. You will find Him if you look for Him with all your heart and with all your soul. God will reveal Himself to you if you seek Him. The Bible says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Seek, Jesus says, seek and you shall find. So God is accessible. He wants to reveal Himself to us, but we have to make the effort. So this, this faith that walks with God. This faith that pleases Him is a, is a faith that believe, believes that He exists. It's, it's a faith that, that lives and gets rewarded. And, and, and it is this faith that continually seeks to get to know God more and more. If you'll incorporate that into your faith, you are going to have a faith that's pleasing to God. And ultimately you're going to have a faith that ends up in heaven. I'll close with this bit of trivia that I came across. It says, toward the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local newspaper. The obituary read, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before. And he died a very rich man. Well, that was a mistake. Actually, it was Alfred's older brother who had died. And the newspaper reporter had bungled the epitaph. But the account had a profound effect on Nobel. He decided he wanted to be remembered for something other than developing a means for killing a lot of people and being uh, <laughs> amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Peace Prize, award for scientists and writers who foster peace. I want to ask you this morning, how will you be remembered when you're gone? I hope all of us here will be like Enoch. I hope all of us will be remembered as people who walked with God. Let's pray. Hi there, I'm John Wagner, minister of New Discovery Christian Church here in Hernando, Mississippi. And I wanna thank you for visiting our YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoy the sermons and I hope the Lord 
builds you up through his word as I do my best to present it to you. If you're ever in the area, feel free to drop by and check us out live and in person. Once again, thank you for checking out our YouTube channel.